Howdy, folks. This is just a reminder that if you like this content, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially subscribing to the video. And be sure to hit the bell notification when you do so that you always get notified whenever I have a new video out, whether it's Mysterious World or something else. These days, I usually have several videos out a week. Hope you enjoy this. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. I was so mesmerized by the music, I forgot that I'm supposed to talk. <laughs> I love that music. Uh, it's weird questions. Use your words, psycho. <laughs> I know. Darren's looking at me like, you know, you have a job. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> I have woke up. Uh, Jimmy Aiken, our guest, which is a good thing because it's weird questions with Jimmy Aiken uh, this hour as it was last. Welcome back, Jimmy Aiken. Thank you. Very glad to be back. And uh, uh, lots of... <laughs> Lots of weirdness yet to come. I, I, I know I we're starting out with a Hitler question. I, I, we didn't. Okay. Not good timing to start the hour with a Hitler question, but well, here we go. Uh, presupposition. This is from April. April, thank you for the question. Presupposition, colon. Hitler is currently in hell. Assuming case, that we're, we're assuming that. Yep, okay. okay. Assuming that's true, if someone went back in time and killed Hitler before he attained the age of reason, would he go to heaven? Or if someone traveled back in time and prevented someone else from committing mortal sin that in, that in, orig that in the original timeline condemned the person to hell? Did I get that? I, I read that wrong. Yeah. It, so, no, you read it right. Okay. Um, so what April's asking is, what if, you, what if you did this, you know, assuming Hitler's in hell, what would happen if you, to his soul, if you went back and uh, changed history so that he died before he hit the age of reason and was responsible for mortal sin? And it's essentially the same question as what if you, what if someone has committed mortal sin that sends them to hell, and you go back and stop them from committing that mortal sin. It's getting at the same principle, whether it's Hitler or someone else. You're changing history so that someone never commits a mortal sin that would send them to hell, even though they otherwise went to hell and in the original timeline. So the ability to change timelines is um, something that scientists have thought about a lot. And basically, there are two plausible scientific options. Now, you see a lot of sloppy science fiction, or at least sloppy may not be the right word, but you see a lot of science fiction that doesn't re that involves changing time that doesn't really correspond to how it would likely work in the real world if it's possible. The two basic options are that scientists have discerned are either there is some kind of chronology protection principle that would prevent you from changing history, or if you can change history, what you're really doing is causing timelines to branch, like in, um, like in the movies uh, Back to the Future. Um, but the old, unlike Back to the Future, the original timeline doesn't cease to exist. You're just causing it to branch in a new way. So like if in one timeline you came to an intersection and, and turned left and you change history so that when you approach that intersection now, you turn right instead of turning left, the original turn left timeline still exists. It's just now you're in a different timeline. You're in one now where you turned right instead of turned left. But the old timeline is still out there. It doesn't cease to exist. And those are really the only two plausible ways that time travel in, could relate to history, uh, at least based on what we've presently discerned. So we've already eliminated the you can't change history option because uh, April said, assuming someone went back in time and killed Hitler before the age of reason. So that would involve a change in history. And that would mean we're in the other possibility, which is that what you're really doing when you change history is you're creating a new timeline. Well, okay, in this new timeline, Hitler's soul would go to heaven because he was baptized as a baby and you killed him before the age of reason, so he couldn't have committed a mortal sin yet. So if you kill him in that period, he'll definitely go to heaven. But that doesn't mean the other timeline isn't still there. There is that timeline where he grew up and became a monster and was responsible for the deaths of millions of people that April presupposed had sent him to hell. 
So what would what we could conclude from this is if it's possible to change timelines, and we don't know that, but if it's possible to change timelines, then our souls, like the timelines themselves, will branch. And so if there's a timeline where you became a monster and killed six million people and that sends you to hell, then there's a timeline where you're in hell. And if there's a timeline where you died before you hit the age of reason and thus never committed a mortal sin, well, you're in heaven in that timeline. And so our souls would be branching, kind of like coral, you know, um, you know the coral plant, how it branches. And, um, and so that's what would happen with Hitler. But what would happen with you? If you're the person who went back and killed an innocent child, well, in that case, you've just killed an innocent person, and that's a mortal sin. And so by creating a new timeline where Hitler goes to heaven in this timeline, you may have doomed yourself to hell by using immoral means to create this timeline, and in, unless, of course, you repent. Recently, I watched um, all four seasons of a show called 12 Monkeys. It's based on the movie 12 Monkeys, and the show involves, it's like the 2040s, and civilization was destroyed in the 20 teens by a plague that wiped out almost everybody. And so the people in the 2040s are trying to fix their history by stopping that plague and it becomes a much bigger plot there's all kinds of other stuff once they start making progress on the plague they realize they're part of a much bigger plot and in 12 monkeys it's interesting they wrestle with you know themes like moral responsibility and stuff and one of the things characters do is uh, they in order to try to change history into a more preferable form they kill people, you know, very casually sometimes. Hmm. And and part of the rationale is, well, yeah, but once we reset history, everyone's going to be alive again and have a much better life. And they don't take seriously the timelines issue. Because really, if, if, if you're really changing history and if what you're really doing is, is causing branching timelines, you're just killing people indiscriminately, and those timelines still exist where you killed this person. And, they're, and, they're, and, and even if you ultimately get to a timeline where that person lives, that doesn't mean you've wiped out the timeline where you killed them. And oh. so there are some unexplored moral consequences. And I was thinking about, you know, maybe I ought to write a novel where you have these gung-ho time travelers wanting to fix history and doing immoral things on the grounds. It'll all be okay once we get the right timeline established. And yeah. then they realize, oh, no, we just created a whole bunch of timelines <laughs> where it, things are much, much worse. Yeah. They, it, it, all of which would be avoided if they just followed the Ten Commandments. Well, like, it certainly would help. <laughs> Although following the Ten Commandments may not stop a worldwide plague. No, that's true. Oh, yeah, that's right. I, not all of that would be avoided. Uh, all right, 12 I, monkeys, I will huh? say it's, in, it's interesting watching a, a series based on a worldwide plague and how it mutates over time after COVID. <laughs> you know, that, 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 that whole thing has changed for us. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. Well, thank you very much uh, uh, for the... Wait, when, who, who was that? That was April. That was April. April. Thank you, April, for the question. I, I better take a quick break. We'll be right back with more weird questions for Jimmy Aiken on Catholic Answers Live. Stay with us for more Catholic Answers Live. Underwriting for Catholic Answers Live is provided by Magnificat. Published monthly, Magnificat features daily mass, prayers, articles, and meditations in step with the liturgical rhythm of the Church on the web at magnificat.com. EWTN has its own official YouTube channel with tens of thousands of videos covering just about every conceivable topic of interest to Catholics. And best of all, it's free. Every day, EWTN adds new TV shows, live events, devotionals, homilies, and specials to its YouTube channel. Visit the EWTN YouTube channel today. EWTN, the Global Catholic Network. Welcome back. 
Catholic Answers Live. I am Cy Kelly, your host. Jimmy Aiken is our guest, and it's weird questions for Jimmy Aiken of this hour. This one comes from Patrick. Patrick writes, The sacred scriptures and sacred tradition are silent on the identity of Thomas's twin. Do we have any early dated information about him? Do we have any accounts from legendary sources about him? Further along, do we have any writings from saints about him? I read that there's a Gnostic source identifying Jesus as Thomas's twin. Okay, so what Patrick's referring to is the Apostle Thomas uh, from the Gospels, and we're told in John that he was not only called Thomas, but he was also called Didymus. Didymus is a Greek word that means twin, and actually Thomas is a Hellenized version of an Aramaic word that means twin. In Aramaic, Toma means twin, but since Toma would be feminine in Greek, because it's got that A ending, they stick an S on it, so it's not feminine, and that's how we get Thomas. Um, so since this individual, one of the twelve, was called twin, that suggests he was a twin. Now, some people have tried to... Uh, find a sort of a symbolic meaning to that name, but probably he had a, a biological twin, either fraternal or identical. Um, we don't really, and Patrick is correct, we don't really know a lot about who the twin would have been. One thing that we have just a hint of evidence for is what Thomas's birth name would might have been. It might have been Judas. There is some manuscript evidence that would suggest that Thomas's birth name might have been Judas, and then he they called him twin to distinguish him from other Judases, like Judas Iscariot or St. Jude, the good one. Um, and so there's a possibility he might have been named Judas, but that's very uncertain. When it comes to who his twin would have been, we know almost nothing. But we do know something. His twin probably was not a member of the Christian community during the ministry of Jesus. Because if he was then we probably would have heard more about him. Just like, you know, we hear about James and John and the fact they're brothers, and um, Peter and Andrew and the fact that they're brothers. If, if, Thomas, if Thomas's twin was a member of the Christian community, especially, then he would have been known to the, the, the audiences of the original Gospels, and we probably would have heard about him. Uh, at, at least it, there's a good chance we would have heard about him. We would have heard about, you know, Aristion and Judas and their twins, but we don't. We only hear about one of the twins. So the other twin probably was not a Christian, at least during, and certainly not a member of the core Christian community, at least during the, the ministry of Jesus. So what about later sources? Well, we have a, um, a document known as the Acts of Thomas, and it's kind of like the book of Acts. You know, it tells the story of what Thomas did after the ministry of Jesus. You know, the book of Acts does that for Peter and Paul. And so there were other books of Acts that were written in the early church, and there is one that focuses on Thomas, and it talks about him going to India and things like that. Um, the Acts of Thomas was written sometime between the 2nd and the 4th century, so between the 100s and the 300s just call it, let's say, the 200s, since we're not sure. And it says that Thomas was the spiritual twin of Jesus, not the biological twin of Jesus, but spiritually. He was similar to Jesus. Or, according to some accounts I've read, and I haven't looked this up in the Acts of Thomas itself, it may indicate that he had a similar physical appearance to Jesus, even though um, they weren't biologically related. So he's either physically similar in appearance, or he was spiritually similar to Jesus, and on that basis he got called the twin, meaning the twin of Jesus. I think this is unlikely. Um, I think it is much more likely that he had a, an actual physical twin. There is also another book called uh, Thomas the Contender, 
uh, which was written in the early third century. So this is the early 200s. And it says that Thomas was a biological twin of Jesus. So he's Jesus's twin. And this is just not credible at all. Nobody buys this. Um, our earliest sources do not indicate that Jesus had a twin. And having a twin is something that is remarkable and that would get mentioned. You know, when they have twins in the Old Testament, like Jacob and Esau, it gets mentioned. And we do have accounts of Jesus' birth, and they only talk about Jesus being born by Mary. None of them talk about, oh, and then this other guy came out of her womb, too. So this is late speculation, and the Gospel of Thomas the Contender is actually a Gnostic work. Acts of Thomas is not necessarily Gnostic, although it has some Gnostic tendencies, um, but Thomas the Contender is a Gnostic work, and it does, as Patrick uh, said, identify Jesus as Thomas's twin, but historically that's very implausible, and no scholar takes that seriously. Okay, thank you for the question, uh, Patrick. Appreciate that. Uh, this one comes from Terry, and Terry asks this, Jimmy, assume that the evidence that consciousness is non-local is correct, that is, mm -hmm. that the mind exists separate and outside the body, and thus our brains are simply complex, bespoke antennas capturing the frequency of our knowledge and personality, like tuning an antenna to a radio frequency. Would this explain stories of telepathy, mind reader is picking up another station, reincarnation, antenna is accidentally so close to the frequency that it picks up the, the signal and, is in, and its embedded information, or even something as mundane as... While a blow to the head changes the receiver enough that it picks up another station, brain trauma causes personality changes. Okay, so um, the assumption that, uh, that consciousness is non-local is actually supported in the history of Catholic thought by individuals like St. Thomas Aquinas. We mentioned earlier that um, that Aquinas, you know, says the soul doesn't really, and this is Aquinas' opinion, there is another opinion, but Aquinas says the soul doesn't have a location. And just like angels, since they don't have bodies, they don't have locations. Instead, you can say that an angel or a soul is present wherever it's manifesting. Um, and that's a non-local description of consciousness. So our our our, our minds, our souls, our consciousnesses don't really have a location, but we can speak of them as if they're in our bodies because they manifest through our bodies and our brains. And um, there's additional evidence that they're from parapsychology that there are non-local aspects to consciousness. So that all checks out, and Terry is assuming all that's true. What he then goes on to ask is, should we understand or he kind of assumes that we should understand our brains as sort of like antennas capturing a frequency um, from consciousness and that this might explain other phenomena. Well, the basic answer is that, yes, uh, th this model may explain um, various phenomena like telepathy or past life memories or things like that, personality changes. Um, but we want to be a little bit careful um, because we're assuming a sender-receiver model that is based on radio. And this um, model goes back to the early 20th century um, when Marconi, you know, came up with radio and it was a big new thing. And whenever a big new idea comes around, people try to use it as a model for other things that they're still figuring out. And so in the early 20th century, it was thought that, um, that okay, we've, we understand how radio works and it involves the transmission of information over a distance without a physical medium in between. Um, and we and telepathy seems to involve the transmission of information over a distance without requiring a physical medium, you know, like a telegraph wire. And so let's use radio as a model for how telepathy works. And there is even a book published by uh, Upton Sinclair, a famous American writer, um, called Mental Radio. Albert Einstein was very interested in telepathy, and he actually wrote a foreword 
for one of the editions of Mental Radio. Um, but over the course of the 20th century, we found that telepathy has some differences, at least in the observable effects in parapsychological studies of telepathy. It had some differences from radio. One of the things that radio is dependent on is a is a signal to transmit the information. You know, you broadcast radio waves. And signals tend to degrade over time based on how they expand and fill space. They get weaker. So you have a certain amount of energy in the signal at the broadcast tower, but then as that signal ripples out spherically from the broadcast tower, it gets weaker and weaker as it goes. It also gets blocked by things like the curvature of the Earth. So that's one reason why you can't hear radio stations on the other side of the planet just by radio waves. And so parapsychologists found telepathy doesn't seem to be subject to those limitations. It doesn't seem to matter how far away the people are, and it doesn't matter if this, if the bulk of the Earth is between them. It seems to work anyway to the extent that it seems to work. And so um, it doesn't look like telepathy or other parapsychological phenomena have the same kind of limitations that radio waves do. And so that's led to a questioning of, um, of is this radio-like model with antennas and receivers and stuff, is that accurate? It, um, there have been a lot of people in the parapsychological community who have said we sh really shouldn't think in terms of this radio sender receiver model. Consciousness is even more non-local than that. But our brains may function not as antennas exactly, but as transducers. Now, what a transducer is, is it's a device, a thing, that translates one kind of thing into another kind of thing. And antennas are an example of that. Antennas are transducers. They take radio waves from the air and convert them into electrical signals that go down a wire. We also have all of our senses are transducers. You know, our eyes translate mm -hmm. light waves that come into the eye into electrochemical signals that travel through our nervous system. Similarly, uh, all of our other uh, senses like our hearing translates sound waves in the atmosphere into electrical chemical si electrochemical signals that get taken to our brain. So we've got transducers all over the place, just in our own bodies. And the proposal is not so much that the brain is an antenna as a transducer that converts consciousness into physical action in the body. And it's possible if you mess with a transducer, you're going to mess up its function. You know, if you if you have a radio and you start monkeying with the settings enough, you're you can just you can impede the radio from functioning correctly. You know, or a television. Television is another kind of tra involves transducers. You can mess up the video signal. And so it's possible if the brain transduces things that it transduces consciousness that you could have um, personality changes like the famous case of Phineas Gage. I think his name was who got a train spike through his head and his whole personality changed. He became a nasty person. Mm -hmm. um, well, you messed with his transducer if if this theory is correct. And it's possible that um, <clears throat> that uh, this uh, non-locality of consciousness and the transduction function of the brain could be responsible for things like telepathy or cases of the reincarnation type where someone thinks they remember being another person, but really what they're doing is picking up information from somebody else's life. Um, I actually talked about that in episodes uh, 275 and 276 of Mysterious World. So you can go to mysterious.fm slash 275 and especially mysterious.fm slash 276 for an exploration of how this psychic link theory of reincarnation memories might work. It would explain them without actual reincarnation. So anyway, those are some thoughts on that subject. And what Terry's asking about is fundamentally in the ballpark. Um, and it is possible to explain a lot of these phenomena along these lines. We just want to be careful about too quickly adopting the signal receiver radio model. 
Yeah. As you were talking, I realized it's just the mind, when you talk about non-local, that's literally you can't imagine non-local. You can, you, it's it's hard to imagine non-local. Radio waves actually are a local phenomenon. Right, right. Uh, well, hey, thanks, Terry, uh, for the question. That's why we love Weird Questions with Jimmy Aiken, an opportunity to get into things that we don't normally get into. Uh, and what, one of the things we do normally get into is Jesus, and we've got a whole conference on Jesus uh, coming up the, the on the parables, sermons, and conversations of yeah. Jesus Christ. It's called Learn From Me. And, and we, do, we do really get into Jesus. I mean... Jesus is just all right with me. And and me as well, Jimmy. And I wish I knew the name of the band I would say that, but now I don't remember. The Doobie Brothers. Oh, that was the Doobie Brothers, yes. And with the Doobie Brothers as well. Uh, you can find out all about our conference at catholicanswersconference.com. If you use the word early as your promo code, E-A-R-L-Y, you get $50 off your conference ticket when you sign up at Catholic AnswersConference.com. More weird questions for Jimmy Aiken right after this on Catholic Answers Live. When the resurrected Jesus appeared to disciples on the road to Emmaus, they didn't recognize him until the breaking of the bread. The same is true today. In the Holy Eucharist, we really meet Jesus. In The Eucharist is Really Jesus, author Joe Heschmeyer explains how knowing Jesus in the Eucharist is the key to understanding all of Christian faith. Order your copy of The Eucharist is Really Jesus today at shop.catholic.com or get it at a good Catholic bookstore. If you're not a Bible scholar, the full message of how the Sunday Mass readings fit together can be tough to comprehend. Apologist Carlo Broussard is here to help. Join Carlo every Friday for the Sunday Catholic Word Podcast. In each episode, he unpacks the scripture readings for that Sunday and brings them all together so you can better understand and defend the faith. Visit SundayCatholicWord.com to subscribe. That's SundayCatholicWord.com. Want to get right to the core of Christ's saving message? Want a roadmap for living the life Christ calls you to? It's time to look again at the Beatitudes. In his new book, Heart of the Gospel, How the Beatitudes Show Us God's Plan for Happiness, Father Sebastian Walsh demonstrates compellingly how these eight declarations make up the foundation, the essence, and the final goal of Jesus' teaching. Heart of the Gospel illuminates the scriptural passages from which we get the Beatitudes, explains the significance of their wording, their order, and their timing in Jesus' ministry and it draws out edifying parallels and connections with salvation history in the lives of the saints. Most importantly, Father Walsh offers wise counsel from his own work as a priest and teacher to help you live the Beatitudes in your own life. Order your copy of Heart of the Gospel today at shop.catholic.com or ask for it at a good Catholic bookstore near you. Back to Catholic Answers Live, where this whole hour, as a matter of fact, both hours today, devoted to weird questions with Jimmy Aiken. Jimmy Aiken, of course, our guest, and more weirdness to come. And I have to say, people have done a good job. I've enjoyed the weird questions today. Jeanette asks this, Jimmy. Say I die and go to hell. Okay. Oh, I thought you were going to say. <laughs> no, I think she has more than that. I'm just okay. acknowledging the starting premise. All right. Say I die and go to hell because I decided to intentionally miss Mass, to stay home, day drink, and play Animal Crossing. Will I know what my Sulphur Lake neighbor is there for? Like, will I look across the bubbling fire pit and see, for example, a Catholic politician who publicly supported abortion? Will I be able to be like, yeah, glad they're facing justice for their part in such evil as I burn alongside them? Or will I be so deep in my own self-misery, I won't care? Well, the fundamental answer is we don't know. We can speculate in situations like this, but God hasn't told us the answer to these questions. Um, We do have uh, some evidence from Scripture that 
the judgment will be public. The, the final judgment will be public because Jesus like talks about whatever you whisper in the darkness is going to be shouted from the rooftops. And that would suggest that we will have at least some knowledge of what other people have done, um, whether they're damned or saved, you know, we'll have that awareness. And so it's quite possible that we will be aware if we're damned of what other damned people have done. Um, the second question, will we be able to react to that in a way that goes beyond just caring about ourselves? You know, so we're not just, she asks, will I be so deep in my own misery I won't care? Or will I be able to say, oh, good, I'm glad that person who did something horrible is getting their comeuppance. Um, well, we also have a little bit of evidence in this regard in the form of the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, where the rich man is not totally self-absorbed once he realizes the situation he's in. He still has a natural, he doesn't have a supernatural love of God, but he's got enough natural affection for his brothers. He wants to try to save them from this fate. And so he proposes to Abraham that Lazarus be sent back from the dead to warn his brothers. And Abraham says, well, they've got Moses and the prophets, let him listen to them. So his request isn't granted, but at least the way he's depicted in this parable, the rich man is not totally self-absorbed. He, he does want good for his relatives. And so that would suggest that we, even the damned, aren't totally self-absorbed and don't care about anything other than, than themselves. So if uh, Jeanette were in hell, suffering for her horrendous sin of playing Animal Crossing, um, I mean, I understand that's not what she's actually proposing, but uh, she yeah. does mention it. Um, the uh, she could look over and say, see an abortionist in hell and say, oh, I'm glad that baby killer is getting his just desserts. That would be possible, um, at least given the non self absorption that we see in the rich man in the parable. Mm -hmm. But it's only a parable, so we can't rely on it as if it's a literal account. Um, so I have to kind of put an asterisk there and say, there's some evidence suggesting that we won't be totally self-absorbed, but don't know it for sure. Then there's a further question, because if Jeanette is able to look at, uh, it, it has, this, has the awareness and non-self-absorption to look at someone else and say, oh, they're getting what they deserve, she might have that for herself too. And she might be able to look at herself in the afterlife and say, you know what? what I'm getting is just. I deserve this. It's not fun, but I chose to turn my back on God in a deliberate way, and I am I chose to be without him, and, and I understand why this is happening, and I accept it. This is the right thing to happen, even though it's not fun. Kind of like some people, you know, you might be playing, you know, mumbly peg, which is a knife game, and you might accidentally stab yourself with the knife and then have to go get stitched up, and that's not fun, but you're saying, yeah, I need I need to get stitched up. This is the right thing to happen. I was foolishly playing with a knife, mm -hmm. and I stabbed myself, and this is the natural consequence of this. I don't enjoy it, but it's the right thing to do now. And a damned person might have that level of self-awareness as well. Jeanette, thank you for the question. Uh, it's weird questions for Jimmy Aiken, and this one comes from Terry, and it involves things that I have no idea what Terry is talking about. So, here we go. I'll explain them. Do DMT machine elves have existence outside the consciousness of the person encountering them? And if so, and because of their complex semi-human, inhuman appearances, is there any chance that they could have been the angels encountered in scriptural times? Okay, so we need to start by talking about what DMT machine elves are. Uh, the term, oh, and I'm blanking on the name of the guy who coined it now, uh, Terrence McKenna, um, if I recall correctly. So um, Terrence McKenna was a psychonaut, meaning he was an individual who used psychedelic drugs to explore mental realms. And one of the things that he and others have reported when taking certain uh psychoactive drugs like DMT, uh, which is a hallucinogen, is encountering entities 
that uh, that they meet and that they communicate with in this psychologically psychedelic state. And McKenna described uh, these as kind of small beings and looked kind of like Christmas tree ornaments sometimes. And they were very active and they were communicating with him and and relating to him and they were kind of surprised to see him but oh hey now that you're here this is great and and um and they were kind of me- robotic or mechanical at the same time they seemed that way and so he called them since he had them under the influence of dmt he called them dmt machine elves but other people have just called them you know like dmt entities and things like that because other people have reported them too well, um, I've done some study in this area. I have not taken psychoactive drugs, but I have um, done some reading in this area, and I, I plan to do more reading in this area, and I ultimately plan, plan to talk about uh, these entities on Mysterious World. At my present state of research, I am unaware of any evidence that would establish the DMT elves or DMT DMT entities as having an independent existence. Um, you know, it. For all I know, they're just like the people you meet in your dreams. When you meet someone in a dream, doesn't mean that they're a real person. Um, you know, uh, they mm-hmm. they they could just be. They likely are. If you've never seen them before, they likely are just a construct of your subconscious you know, dreaming module. And even if there's someone, you know, it's not the real person. If I see my sister in a dream, it's not really my sister, at least most of the time, it's not really going to be my sister. It's a simulation of my sister that my subconscious dream module has come up with. And in the same way, I, uh, you know, if you have someone take a drug and they effectively start dreaming, Mm -hmm. Well, then I would assume that unless we have some other kind of evidence that any entities they report encountering are manufactured by their subconscious. So how could we get information that or evidence that would support them as having an independent existence? Well, I can imagine a few ways of doing that. One way of doing it would be to obtain veridical knowledge from these entities. In other words, uh, you could get information from them that you don't know and that goes beyond random chance. So it needs to be really specific information, not the sun is going to come up tomorrow. Um, But you could get specific information that goes beyond random chance that you don't know when you go into the drug state. And then you can and then you verify that information after you're in the drug state. So if you could get veridical information, information that's true, that goes beyond random chance that you didn't previously know, then that could provide evidence that you're actually dealing with another mind. Another way is if you were able to have these uh, entities perform an effect in the world that's observable objectively. Like you go into the drug state and you say, hey, my buddy's back at the lab. They really want to know if you're real or not. Could you psychokinetically knock over a book that we set up on a lab table? And if the book gets knocked over, well, that could be evidence suggesting that some entity that you encountered knocked the book over since you made that request. Um, So those would be possible ways to gain evidence that DMT entities are more than just subconscious constructs, but it wouldn't prove it. And this is a classic issue in parapsychology. Um, Just because an effect happens, that doesn't mean you know who did it. It, if, If psychic functioning is real so like if and this is i'm I'm not saying it is but if esp is real where people can pick up information psychically or if psychokinesis is real where people can influence matter mentally how do you know it wasn't you 
that produced the effects. Maybe when you asked for the veridical information, your own ESP got it, and you just processed it in the dream as being told to you by the machine elves. Or if the book got knocked over, maybe you knocked it over with your own psychokinesis, but you processed that as, oh, the machine elves knocked it over. So even having these this kind of evidence wouldn't prove it that they have an independent reality. So this would be, this is a very tricky issue, and I don't know that there's an ultimate way to solve it. It's really a subcase of what in philosophy is known as the problem of other minds. Having said that, the other aspect of Terry's question is, could um, these complex semi-human, inhuman appearance beings have been the angels that were encountered in scriptural times? And there are angelic beings that look really weird, like the cherubim and the seraphim that are composite animals. The seraphim are more snake-like, but they've got six wings. Uh, the cherubim are a composite of different types of animals and have four wings. And then there are these others that, that are kind of like wheels covered in eyes. And the cherubim and seraphim also tend to be covered in eyes. So they do look really weird. Hypothetically, could drugs like DMT be allowing you to have a perception of the realm where angels are hanging out? Hypothetically, uh, maybe. I can't rule that out. I would worry about even if you have a perception of this angelic realm, um, you may be getting distorted perceptions of it. You may not be perceiving it accurately but you might be having some kind of a perception of it and you might be having a perception of angels but they might be the bad ones so there are significant risks here on the other hand as i said the dmt machine elves they may just be subconscious products of our or products of our subconscious that are basically hallucinations. Terry, thank you for the question. A whole area of, of uh, knowledge I hadn't, I, I didn't even know existed, DMT machine elves. So now I know. Uh, more weird questions coming up right after this for Jimmy Aiken on Catholic Answers Live. You're listening to Catholic Answers Live. Underwriting for Catholic Answers Live is provided by Real Estate for Life. Real Estate for Life connects home buyers and sellers to real estate agents while supporting pro-life organizations on the web at realestateforlife.org. The world over with Raymond Arroyo. Coverage as seen through a Catholic lens. All people of faith and sincerity need to awaken to this and protect this fundamental right of religious liberty. Expert analysis. Does revelation judge history or does history judge revelation? Stories vital to people of faith. It's part of our faith that comedy and tragedy naturally go hand in hand. Delivered to your inbox every week. Sign up today. Go to EWTN.com slash world over. Who was the first Catholic in your family? Were they evangelized by a friend, a coworker, a stranger? Did you ever think that you could be that person that God uses to save a soul? And that soul could save their family, their grandchildren, and generations to come. At St. Paul Street Evangelization, a Catholic nonprofit, we train, equip, and mobilize Catholic disciples to do the urgent work of evangelization. Catholic Answers is supported in part by St. Paul Street Evangelization, streetevangelization.com. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. Jimmy Aiken is our guest, and it's Weird Question Day. we got lots of weird questions for Jimmy Aiken. Uh, this one comes from Karen, Jimmy. Did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? Well, okay, um, so we're going to assume that Adam and Eve are literal historical individuals for purposes of answering this question, and in order to answer it, we need to figure out two things about Adam and Eve and belly buttons. The first thing we need to figure out is how do belly buttons form? What is responsible for them? And for and now, as a lot of people will know, uh, a belly button is formed at the point on your body where the umbilical cord was attached when you were still in your mother's womb. Um, but why does it form? For the longest time, I assumed that it was genetic, that there's something in our genes that 
when the umbilical cord falls off, it creates a belly button there. And it's not just like a scar left from the, it's not just the result of healing when the, when the umbilical cord falls off. But I always try to check myself out. And so I checked myself out some time ago and discovered, oh, no, it apparently is just a healed wound. There's not a genetic thing that forces um, belly buttons to occur in that way. It appears to just be a wound from where the oh. um, where the umbilical cord fell off. So the second thing we would need to figure out about Adam and Eve in particular is how did they come into the world? Were they born? Were they ever in the womb? Did they ever have umbilical cords? Well, the way the text presents their creation in Genesis uh, 2, Adam is basically a Hebrew version of Galatea. Galatea was a statue um, also Pygmalion, but Galatea was a statue in Greek folklore that the gods created and then gave life to. And that's basically what Adam is. Um, he, God makes his body as a statue and then he breathes the spirit of life into his nostrils and Adam becomes a living soul. And so he was started, he, he wasn't in a womb here. Hmm. Also, when it comes to Eve, uh, God puts Adam into a deep sleep, takes out one of his ribs, and then fashions it into a woman. And there's no mention of her being in a womb. So if, uh, if this account is meant literally, then Adam and Eve would not necessarily have belly buttons. I mean, they might have them if God chose to build them with belly buttons. You know, mm -hmm. God could have put a belly button on the statue, and he could have put a belly button on Eve. Um, but if they never were in wombs and never had umbilical cords, then they wouldn't need to have belly buttons. On the other hand, um, it is generally conceded by, uh, by many Catholic thinkers today, and, and the magisterium has indicated it has no problem with this, that uh, going back to uh, Humanae Vitae in 1950 under Pius XII, um, that these narratives may not be literal and they may be read in a way that is consistent with the idea of the first humans acquiring their bodies from pre-humans, pre living pre-humans who were like almost people, but not almost modern humans, but not quite. And in that case, Adam and Eve would have been born in the wombs of their immediate predecessors who would have been almost human, but not almost modern humans, but not quite. And they therefore would have had um, umbilical cords and they therefore would have belly buttons. And so uh, the answer to whether they have belly buttons is going to depend on which theory you endorse regarding the origin of Adam and Eve. Should the Genesis 2 text be read strictly literally, or should it be read in a non-literal way that represents the creation of the first humans from prior biological forms in which that God used as part of his plan, in which case they would have belly buttons, definitely. Karen, thank you uh, for the question. I'm going to keep moving, see how many of these I can get in. And this one comes from Deacon Brian. Why did UFO appearances look more like flying saucers back in the 40s and 50s? And did the technology become more advanced with sightings of Tic Tacs and more elaborate craft? Okay, to the extent that UFOs are not real, you know, a lot of people see stuff that they interpret as oh that's a ufo and really it's not it uh, they, i mean it may be an unidentified object to them but it may turn out it's a perfectly conventional object like for example um in the 1960s there were lots of sightings of glowing discs in the twilight sky and it turns out what a lot of those were were secret spy planes that were meant to fly so fast they didn't even have paint on them in order to keep them light. And so what people were seeing, since it's twilight, and they're seeing this glowing disc looking thing up there, they're seeing the central body of the air, of the vehicle, of the air, uh, spy plane, that's made out of titanium, 
and is not painted. And so even though it's getting dark here on Earth, the sun is still peeking over the horizon from the altitude that the spy plane is at. And so the sun is still shining up at that altitude, and it's hitting the titanium surface and making it look like it glows. But down on at the elevation of ground level, the sun's already set, and so it looks it's it's getting dark. But you see this glowing circular thing in the sky, because at that altitude, you're not seeing all the details mm-hmm. of how the plane is shaped. You're seeing the central mass of the plane, and if you've been if you've heard the term flying saucer, and your brain can interpret that as a circle, then that's how your brain's going to interpret it. So the popularization of the term flying saucer may have itself influenced how people perceived things. So they would tend to perceive them as if they're circular when they may not strictly be circular. And if that applies to um, to spy planes like the SR-71 Blackbird and the, the Oxcart, which was the classif- more classified CIA version, um, then uh, it'll apply to real UFOs, too, if any of them are alien craft. You know, if you've been told, oh, flying saucers are appearing in our sky, then you're going to see things in terms of flying saucers unless they're very different from Mm -hmm. flying saucers now in terms of the origin of the phrase flying saucer it was um it was popularized in 1947 after a sighting uh, up in washington state by a man named kenneth arnold who was himself a pilot he was flying along in his plane and he saw some objects that were kind of flying in a convoy and they were bouncing up and down as they flew and he compared their motion to like what you would see if you skipped a rock or a saucer across the surface of water. You know, it bounce up and down. Mm-hmm. And then when he told the press about that, now he didn't say they were shaped like saucers. He said their motion was like saucers. Um, he said they actually kind of looked like shovel heads or boomerangs or they, they weren't sphere they weren't circular but when he talked to the press the press said oh they move like saucers skipping on water they're flying saucers Mm -hmm. and then people started to perceive round things in the sky well if you think about a shovel head which is kind of how kenneth arnold described these um shovel heads are kind of almost circular you know yeah And so if you're told it's a flying saucer, you could perceive something as a saucer, even though it's not actually a saucer, if you looked at it up close. People also reported a lot of other shapes of um, over the 1940s and 50s of uh, of UFOs, including spheres, you know, the objects that look like balls, cigars, you know, long tubular ones, uh, cigar shaped uh, UFOs were very common. Um, saucers, of course, and things like boomerangs. Um, so there were a lot of shapes there. And to address uh, Deacon Brian's question, well, it's possible that the UFOs could have, if they're extraterrestrial or interdimensional or anything else exotic, it's possible that they could have had technological upgrades. It's also possible their shapes could have changed over time because new ships have arrived, like maybe we saw the Scout ships in the 1940s, and now other kinds of ships have arrived. Um, And it's possible their shapes change because they're shape-changing. Today, we have what are known as variable geometry aircraft or shape-shifting aircraft. Every plane, uh, every jetliner is like this to a degree. If you'll notice, when uh, you see a jetliner... uh, taken off well it's rolling down the runway on these wheels that are on supports and then it gets off the ground and up go the wheels and these flaps cover over where they were when the landing gear retracts and then when they come back down the flaps go out and here come the wheels and then it lands again so that of itself is a form of variable geometry craft But we have even more variable geometry in our aircraft today than that, because there are some planes, they're sometimes known as uh, 
well, I won't have time to describe them, but they'll stick their wings out straight and then bend them back to go faster. Yeah. Well, it may be that even more advanced tech is going to be more variable in its geometry than what we have, in which case, maybe what we're seeing is the same kind of crafts are just changing shapes. Deacon Brian, thanks for ending us on a UFO question. Perfect place to end. Uh, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for two great hours of weird questions. My pleasure. Uh, If you like this, check out Mysterious World, mysterious.fm, or just put in Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. That will do it for us. Uh, I'll invite you again. Come on to the conference. Check it out at catholicanswersconference.com and use that promo code. Use the word early as your promo code and save $50 off your conference ticket. catholicanswersconference.com. See you next time. God willing, right here on Catholic Answers Live. And before we go, just one more reminder that if you like what you've watched, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially subscribing to this channel. I'm trying to grow it, and I'd really appreciate your help. Thank you, and God bless.